welcome again, everyone, um, to today's uh, session on trade. Uh, my name is Jan Bakker from University College London, and it's my pleasure to uh, chair this session today. All right, so thank you very much for being here. Um, very excited about uh, today's session, and I'll yield the floor to uh, Alex Kopstake, who is our first presenter. Alex, the floor is yours. Great, thanks, Jan. Can you just give me a thumbs up, Jan, that you can see this? Yes, you have 15 minutes. Brilliant. Nice one. Cool. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, coming. Thanks for inviting me. Um, CSAE. So this paper is about multiple firms, networks and quality upgrading, looking at the impact of China's expansion on India. So basic motivation, we often think of this kind of very simplistic agriculture manufacturing services uh, development model. Um, India, India has a very young population, large young population that is uh, graduating into uh, the labor force. The question is, where's the employment going to come from? A potential threat to that is China's expansion over the last 20 years. So beyond India, 2 billion people living in large developing countries that have grown large trade deficits with China. Uh, and these have generally emerged following uh, China's accession to the WTO in 2001. For instance, India. So, this is something that wasn't necessarily predicted, um, but China exceeds the WTO in 2001, and we see this massive Indian trade deficit with China appearing. And we also see a massive rise in Chinese exports to the OECD, um, dwarfing Indian exports to the OECD, so potential uh, export competition channel there, which we'll look into in a second. So the research question is going to be how and through which channels did this China trade shock uh, affect Indian manufacturing? To answer that, we're going to have to do a bit of untangling. So the classic China shock story, sort of authored in Hansen, is import competition. Uh, large increase in Chinese exports into the US, outcompeting domestic US workers, uh, leading to various negative outcomes. In the China-India case, we're also going to have to think hard about the export opportunity channel, which is going the other direction. If China is now opening up, then potentially Indian firms can export more to China. Thirdly, as I mentioned, the, the export competition channel. So we've got this uh, the rest of the world, um, particularly the OECD, uh, that China is now exporting into, um, potentially competing with Indian firms that previously exported to that market. Beyond that, if we zoom in on India, there's the import competition channel might come in and affect with zero, but also if we consider the supply chain within the country, there might be other um, spillovers of import competition across the supply chain. So sort of simply to start with, if good zero gets hit by import competition from Chinese firms, then potentially that's going to be a negative demand shock on good minus one firms, so the, the people that supply good zero. On the other hand, if good zero, the market for good zero is becoming more competitive um, because of Chinese competition, then that could have a sort of positive supply shock downstream on producers of good one, because they now have access to maybe cheaper inputs, maybe something happens to quality. So we're gonna to have to untangle these five, and what's gonna, what I'm gonna find when I um, disentangle those is that that last channel, the downstream effects, seems to be where the action is. And more specifically, when we kind of dig into it in more detail, it's a story of cheaper and higher quality imported inputs coming in from China and then driving quality upgrading or allowing quality upgrading to Indian firms further down that supply chain. I'm then going to investigate the spillovers of that upgrade, upgrading in two dimensions. So firstly, over time, and we're going to see that it persists for at least 10 years, and then taking into account the whole production network, we're going to see the impact output uh, linkages actually amplify this effect by up to 75%. So overall, the takeaway is going to be that a supply-driven quality upgrading mechanism is generating important direct and indirect gains from trade, which is quite contrary to the sort of 
common China shock narrative has particularly emerged from uh, developed countries. Just to fix ideas on what I mean by this quality upgrading, so these are two firms that I've interviewed. Uh, on the left, we've got a small electric vehicle startup, and essentially throughout the 2000s, they're getting uh, cheaper uh, lithium ion battery cells, which allow their batteries to be lighter, which means that the vehicles have a longer charge. On the, on the other side, we've got a very large pharmaceuticals multinational, and they produced little uh, vials of insulin for diabetics. Now, if you have a tiny impurity or a little air bubble in one of those, it could be potentially disastrous. And so the quality upgrade that we're seeing is that there's fewer of those impurities uh, coming in in the inputs from China. So the, the quality upgrade is sort of higher safety. In the interest of time, I will pretty much skip straight through the theory. Uh, essentially, I'm going to um, use a multi-product firm model with monopolistic competition, uh, where firms are competing on cost or quality. Um, then I can observe various outcomes uh, of these firms using both direct observation, but also some off-the-shelf measures to back out markups or back out a measure of quality. That's going to allow me to derive predictions for what I expect the impact through each of these five channels to be. And the key thing is that those predictions tell us that on these last two, so this is revenue and the probability of dropping a product, i.e., which is sort of uh, the inverse of or inversely related to the profitability of that product, um, we're going to see that there should be effects in both directions through each of the five channels. So I'm going to look at all of these uh, 10 outcomes um, as a way to uh, test um, what we're actually observing the effects to be. When I then dive into more detail on the downstream effects, these other channels, which is cost, quality, price, quality adjusted prices, and output, I'm also going to look at those margins. Data is essentially um, large manufacturing plants in India, um, uh, a census and then representative sample below uh, plants for 100 workers, and then standard um, trade flows and tariffs data sets. What's the variation driving it? So we're seeing tariffs falling uh, on the left here. Um, and then what we should see if those tariffs are falling um, between India and China, between uh, China and India, and between China and the rest of the world, we would also expect to see um, a rise in import or export flows, which is what's on the right hand side. Um, I'll talk now about how I'm going to measure uh, exactly what these import competition uh, and so on channels are. Firstly, import competition, this has been sort of used widely in the literature, so uh, we can look at tariffs uh, in 2001, um, Indian tariffs on imports from China, uh, and do a, essentially a difference in difference methodology, so that's going to be one half of the paper. The other half, or the other um, empirical uh, identification strategy is going to be a kind of classic orthogonal Hansen, plausible exogenity. Um, through the flow side. And on the flow side, we're looking at the share of Chinese imports in total Indian imports as the measure of import competition. The other channels, so export opportunities, just going to be flipping all those around. Uh, exactly the same uh, idea. Export competition, similarly, um, except now it's going to be the tariffs from the rest of the world proxied by a sort of smaller subset of. OECD countries, um, uh, their tariffs on China, on the flow side, we're gonna look at the share of Chinese imports in total OECD imports. Then the, it gets slightly more complicated to measure the last two channels. So for this import competition coming in here, I'm gonna then want to derive a measure of the upstream effect of that on good minus one. So what I'm gonna do is take a weighted average of all the tariffs on the output goods which use good minus one as an input. And so this gamma parameter is just going to come out of the input output table. Likewise, um, applying exactly the same for the flows, for downstream, exactly the same interpretation, but the other way around. So I'm now going to look at a weighted average of uh, the tariff on um, imported inputs. So if I'm good one, we look across all the different inputs that I use uh, and then look at the amount of import competition that's affecting each of those and that is giving a weighted sum of the impact downstream one step on this one. Okay, there's going to be some instrumenting as per the uh, orthogonal enhancement method for the flows, 
for the tariffs, it's going to be standard difference and difference. I'll skip through a lot of this because of uh, time, uh, time constraints we're happy to talk to later. Essentially, I'm going to compare all the channels and we'll see that only on the downstream measure um, are things significant and in fact relatively large in both directions. That was on revenue and probability of exit, as I mentioned in the original model. Looking into this in more detail, what we're seeing here, so these, the interpretation of these coefficients is if the tariff in 2001 is 10% higher, if the average tariff on my inputs in 2001 is 10% higher, then marginal costs are going to rise consistent with quality upgrading. We'll see quality rise, prices rise, but ultimately the quality rise is larger than the price rise, so quality loss of prices are falling, no effect on quantity as predicted, revenue is rising, probability of exit is falling, so that's suggesting higher profit. Robust across the different methods, as I mentioned. How does this look over time? So we can essentially see uh, this upgrade persisting at the, there's a bit of a break um, around the financial crisis, but then at the peak 10 years after China's accession, we see a, if you have a 10% higher pre-accession tariff on your inputs, which corresponds to roughly a 10% larger fall in tariffs post W2 accession, we're seeing 5.2% higher price and 5.3% higher quality. You have five minutes left. Great, thanks. Now, that was a very simplistic model of the supply chain. We only looked one step in each direction. There might actually be effects two steps up the supply chain. So if uh, good minus two might be directly affected by good zero, or we might see that there's a ripple effect that persists. So to get at that, essentially, I'm going to repeatedly sum over those input-output coefficients to get my second degree spillover, likewise to get the third degree spillover and so on. So I can then include those in the regression. That's going to give me this sort of profile. So we've got this is getting more and more upstream and we see not much going on. Here's the direct input competition. Again, not much going on. But then we're seeing both price and quality rising one step down the chain. And the key thing is that two steps down, you're still seeing this ripple effect um, being detectable. After that, it fades away. But again, that was still a simplified model because that was just looking two steps up. But actually, the supply chain is not going to be so simply linear. Uh, so for instance, this is a slightly more complicated version where we've got two different goods, minus 2a and minus 2b, being an input into good minus 1. And likewise, we've got good 1 providing an input to both good 2a and good b. Ultimately, we're going to want to take into account all of these um, different upstream network effects and downstream network effects and see how they all play together. So I'm going to be controlling for all of these three in the background. I'm going to be controlling for all these upstream network effects too. Looking at the downstream effect, um, that's where I'm about to go. Just to give you a sense that this impact structure is um, very, uh, is, is much closer, it's a much more complicated story than um, exactly uh, the, those are diagrams I've been showing you. And long story short, I'm going to use the Leontie of inverse bit of matrix algebra to take into account that whole upstream and that whole downstream effect. So that's going to give me swapping out these input output table coefficients for the Leontie of matrix coefficient is going to give me a sense of the total accumulated spillover across the whole upstream and the whole downstream. Looking then at what happens to the downstream effect that I was previously talking about. So these are the one stream effect, the one step effect that I previously showed you. Then when we take into account the whole uh, network effect, um, you can see essentially there's an amplification story going on. So um, the effect is larger and in the, um, at the peak now it's essentially 75% uh, larger of a quality upgrade. So the sort of intuition here is it's not just I get higher quality inputs coming in from China, but it's also the person that's doing, giving inputs to my inputs uh, is getting higher quality inputs. And there's all this kind of complicated web, there's upgrading going on, which ripples out across it. I can detect it at least two steps for each firm, um, but all of it compounded together is giving this larger, is giving this sort of amplified quality effect. So conclude, what I've done is uh, modeled and estimated the impact of the China shock on Indian manufacturing firms through five channels. And I found that the uh, most significant and most important story seems to be this uh, higher quality inputs raising quality prices and revenue, 
which is um, essentially, if we step back to the development story, this looks like a, um, uh, a useful thing for uh, this sort of general concept of upgrading as a route to um, higher incomes, but also at the same time, quality adjusted prices are falling, so it looks good for the consumers. That's persisting for 10 years, it's amplified by the production network, so it looks like India is receiving sort of important direct and indirect gains from trade through the supply of imports of trade in the country. Further research, so, so two main things. One is thinking about other firms, as I mentioned, uh, we actually have of the largest eight countries in the world, if you take out the US, Brazil, and China itself, all of the others have large trade deficits with China that have grown since China's accession. Brazil is different because that's a commodities uh, supply story. So potentially this mechanism has broader implications. Uh, and then lastly, obviously this was all a positive side story. COVID, if we were this time last year, would be exactly talking about the inverse of it, and negative Chinese and Russia. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Alex, for this fantastic presentation. Um, just to remind everyone, please do put uh, your questions uh, into the Q&A box uh, during the presentation, if possible, so that we can um, put them in, in, in order so that we go well prepared into the Q&A session. And um, next up is um, uh, Olamide. Please, uh, the floor is yours for uh, 15 minutes. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here and thank you for having me, CSAE. Uh, today, I'm presenting on the topic of the impact of trade liberalization on structural change in sub-Saharan African countries using Ghana as a case study. Uh, I will spend most of my time um, setting up the study so as to make sense of the results. So structural change is the changes in the relative importance of the three main sectors of any economy in terms of their factor use and production. Uh, and the stylized facts that have been established about structural change and its patterns is that in the process of development, countries generally move from having larger shares of their income in agriculture towards uh, industry or manufacturing and then to services. Uh, as long as sectoral returns to factors of production are not equal, countries can always benefit from structural change. And trade liberalization has been seen as important for structural change, as some recent research finds that the transition out of agriculture is still important for the development of emerging nations. However, structural change in Sub-Saharan Africa has followed a different pattern than expected as industrialization has not been um, that important uh, in the structural change of African countries. Uh, so this graph here shows the value added and employment shares of the different sectors for Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it shows um, these figures here are just the averages for all these countries and the data is from the World Bank Data Bank. And as you can observe, um, employment shares of agriculture are quite high, while value added shares of agriculture are extremely low. Also employment shares of services in Sub-Saharan Africa is the second highest with the employment shares of industry being extremely low uh, and stagnant on average. So obviously industrialization has not played uh, a major role in structural change, even though trade reforms have been seen uh, have been a major part of sub-Saharan African policies for economic development. Standard theories of structural change expect that with international trade, countries can transition out of agriculture by importing agricultural goods when the domestic price under alter key is higher than the international prices. In addition, in order for a country to transition out of agriculture, into manufacturing and other industries, the subsistence needs of the population needs to be provided for by imports. So trade is very important. Um, also for the industrial sector to keep growing without being limited to just the domestic market, international trade must occur. And this is the findings of standard uh, theories of trade. Uh, but Matsuyama notes that these theories of structural change are based on the assumption that economies are closed 
when in reality, most economies are interdependent. And he explains that this leads to a misunderstanding of structural change in an open economy, uh, as the pattern of structural change can actually be ambiguous when you account for the trade effect. Trade liberalization policies have been recommended to African countries as the cure for economic policies. So in the study published in 1981 by the World Bank, um, they attributed most of the blame for the poor performance of African economies on their trade policies. For this reason, trade liberalization was a vital part of structural adjustment programs that the African economies took on in the 1980s. But the effect of trade liberalization on structural change in Africa is ambiguous because most of them experienced trade liberalization in the 1990s, yet structural change has not always been growth enhancing. Therefore, I use the generalized synthetic control methods to evaluate the effect of trade liberalization on structural change using Ghana as a case study. I focus on one country because country case studies force us to understand the institutional and historical context in which these liberalization policies operate. I use Ghana because it is a good case study for sub-Saharan African economies. It is one of the first African countries to gain independence in 1957 and to liberalize trade in 1985. So this makes it particularly good for the method applied as synthetic control methods require a control group that is similar to the treated country, but have, that have not experienced the treatment in the period considered. Also, structural change in Ghana has followed a similar pattern to most other African countries. Um, there are other reasons why Ghana is a good case study, um, which I go into in the paper. But um, in this slide, we can see the pattern of structural change in Ghana. So the black line, um, represents the year of trade liberalization. And as you can see, before and after trade liberalization, employment shares of industry are very low, while employment shares of agriculture um, are really high. Um, and you know, when the employment shares of agriculture begin to fall, um, employment shares of services are what rises instead of industry. So this pattern is what this paper is trying to understand uh, and particularly to look at how international trade has affected this pattern. Uh, so in this paper, I use the generalized synthetic control method because um, it is a useful tool for comparative case studies. Um, it uses a set of control units to create a synthetic version of an observed treated unit. Um, an advantage of using synthetic control methods is that the procedure for selecting comparison units is data-driven and transparent. Uh, and so um, it's unlikely to um, produce comparison units that are, um, that, are uh, that, that have already been pre-designed or um, that the method has been pre designed to bring out. So basically, um, yeah, in standard comparative case studies, the procedure for selecting comparison units um, can be ambiguous and can lead to um, unlikely units because of the inability um, of the methods to show uh, the existence of common characteristics between the treated and the control unit. But with synthetic control units, uh, you can easily observe the similarities between the treated and synthetic unit in the pre and post intervention period. Um, another important strength of the, S of the synthetic control method is that it promotes research honesty in observational studies, as the study can be designed without access to post intervention outcomes. So that's what I was trying to say earlier that this study was designed without knowing how the design will affect the outcome. And so, um, yeah, this is the best kind of way to study or to answer the question of how international trade has affected structural transformation in Africa. Before I go into the empirical analysis, I want to present the timeline of economic and sociopolitical events for the Ghanaian country 
for the Ghanaian economy to show the events that led to um, trade liberalization. So this red line here is the year of trade liberalization in Ghana. And trade liberalization happened in 1985 in Ghana, 28 years after the country gained independence. The post-independence experience of, for Ghana was disappointing as there was economic decline not too long after independence. The first prime minister of the country, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, introduced policies like import substitution strategies that led to unexpected economic decline and led to his eventual overthrow. However, even after his overthrow, the subsequent democratically elected and military leaders adopted policies that were quite similar to Nkrumah's. So the economic and political situation was not greatly improved. And then the late 1970s to early 1980s were particularly bad for the Ghanaian socioeconomy as there was an unexpected widespread drought in the country. And in the early 1980s, um, as well as all the things that are going on, um, there was, you know, millions of Ghanaians were expelled out of neighboring Nigeria, uh, which led to a sudden increase in population. And so the economy was going through a lot around this time. In an attempt to support the economy in 1983, with the help of the World Bank, the Ghanaian prime minister at the time began the economic recovery program, which later became the structural adjustment program. The main objectives of these reforms were to restore the incentives for the production of exports and the increase of the overall availability of foreign exchange, and also to improve the foreign exchange allocation for the country. So the, tra the trade policies under the structural adjustment programs included tariff adjustments and import liberalization. Trade liberalization was therefore done in response to economic decline in Ghana. So the generalized synthetic control estimates the counterfactual, which in this case is value added and employment shares of agriculture, industry and services if Ghana, if trade liberalization did not begin in Ghana in 1985. We have five minutes left. Okay, thank you. So like I just said, the generalized synthetic control estimates the pattern of structural change in Ghana if trade liberalization did not begin in 1985. In order to do this, I use data from a control group of countries who have not yet liberalized trade in the entire period considered. Um, table one here presents the six variables of interest and the countries that make up the control group for each variable. Unsurprisingly, the countries in the control group for Ghana are other developing countries, mostly from Africa, because most developed countries liberalized trade long before 1985. Uh, and for each variable of interest, there's a different set of variables that best match it based on the calculation of the GSC method. Uh, the data used is from a variety of sources, but the year of trade liberalization is determined using data from Waxiag and Welch, um, the paper from 2008, which updates the sachs werner criteria for trade openness. So now I'll talk about the results. Um, the results show that if trade liberalization did not occur in Ghana, value added of industry would have been higher in the long term, while value added of services would not have grown as much as it did. These findings support the find the hypothesis by Roderick, who explains that a plausible explanation for the premature deindustrialization in African economies is trade and globalization. In addition, the value added share of agriculture would have been higher and grown steadily from 1985 if trade liberalization did not occur. For employment shares, um, for the sake of time, I will present the results when I use only four countries in the potential control group. But in the paper, I present, um, I present two employment shares results, one where I use um, more countries, um, but fewer years. But in this one, I use, um, yeah, I show you the entire period considered, but only four countries are in the control group because those are the countries for which data is available for employment shares. These results show that the employment shares of services was higher than it would have been in the post-treatment period if trade liberalization did not occur, indicating that, trade liberal, that the trade liberalization that began in Ghana led to the service sector 
been a more vital sector than it would have been, um, and to the agricultural sector being less significant in terms of value added and employment shares in Ghana. This also supports um, another uh, paper by Jabab Anusei, which shows that the contribution of the service sector in African countries increased after, 19, after the 1980s because of globalization. And so the findings of this paper indicate that um, trade liberalization may have been part of the cause of the pattern of structural change that is observed um, for, that is observed that is not a growth enhancing pattern of structural change. So in, in conclusion, um, African countries uh, have structural change that is not growth enhancing as in the process of structural change, resources move from agriculture towards services instead of towards industry. Uh, and this research shows that trade liberalization may actually have led to this strange pattern of structural change in Ghana. Um, yeah, and thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation. Um, next up is uh, Catherine. Um, so the floor is yours uh, for 15 minutes, Catherine. Okay. Okay, can you just give me a thumbs up that this is all right, yeah? Perfect. Okay, thank you, Jan, and thank you everyone for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, so I am presenting a joint piece of work with Leila O'Kane, who is my co-author at Burning Glass Technologies, which is the data partner for this project. So the research question I'm asking is, does the deployment of AI in high income countries reduce services offshoring to developing ones? And when I'm talking about services offshoring, thinking things like call centers or back office processes like payroll, HR and data entry. So these sectors have been an important force for job creation in countries like India, the Philippines, and parts of Africa, most notably South Africa, which have all followed a somewhat alternative services-led development growth model. So for example, in India, the IT business process outsourcing sector alone contributes 8% of GDP. And in the Philippines, that number is as high as 17%. Recently, there has been a lot of discussion and hype that certain applications of artificial intelligence so, for example, optimal character recognition, which means that humans no, need, no longer need to read um, handwriting on forms or natural language processing, which has automated away a lot of call center work, um, will lead to service sector reshoring. So this is an example of Paul Krugman um, in 2018 at the Rising India Summit saying there's this concept called artificial intelligence you should be wary of. In the future, while diagnosis may be outsourced to a doctor in India, it could also go to a firm based on artificial intelligence. So lots of speculation about the displacement effects of AI. Yet, on the other hand, there's also the prospect that AI could actually enable trade. So there's this big discussion about AI enabling streamlined logistics or machine translation, reducing language barriers and enabling us to trade more and developing countries being a major beneficiary. Then there's also many reasons why this relationship is probably vastly more complex than anyone has also accounted for so far. So there's a growing understanding that AI may be a general purpose technology, which is one which is used widely across industries and is the invention of a method of invention. Um, it also could have countervailing effects by raising productivity or creating new tasks. But on all of these questions so far, there's been very limited work and particularly empirical evidence. And what evidence does exist on AI has typically focused on the impacts on high income countries, on labor markets, and typically in a closed economy setting, not accounting for trade. So what I'm gonna to do today, and I'm not gonna give you an overview and a summary, I'm just gonna take you straight through what I'm doing in this paper. So the idea of this paper, Firstly, is to measure AI deployment using job adverts. 
So there's very little data on firm level use of AI. So what I'm going to do is take this scraped data set, which covers the near universe of all job adverts posted online in the UK, and use the text to understand which firms are hiring AI-related roles by the demand for AI-related skills as stated in the job adverts. So specifically, I use these skills clusters, which are text, using the data from the text to look at words associated and commonly used near to the words machine learning or artificial intelligence, and more broadly measures looking at data science and natural language processing to then classify each job advert as whether it's related to machine learning or not, and then develop metrics at the region, industry, and firm level of um, artificial intelligence demand. Then i matching this data with data on services offshoring data. The UK is a rare country that collects very good data on trade and services because the UK is such a services driven economy and so it's essential for the balance of payments data. So they have very good data specifically on producer intermediate services, which lends itself very well for measuring services offshoring. So we're thinking things like legal services, IT services, accounting services. And I'm looking at firms that are um, importing those services specifically. Then I also use additional data um, on employment and balance sheet variables from other UK um, data sets, the annual business survey and the business register and employment survey. So to take a look at what this comes out with, um, so the most commonly used skills related to the words machine learning and artificial intelligence, unsurprisingly, are things like computer vision, deep learning, neural networks, decision trees. And it turns out that the discussion about artificial intelligence may well not be all hype because there has been very fast growth. So this is the growth in the share of all online job adverts in the UK which are mentioning any of these skills or demanding any of these skills. So there's been pretty fast growth, particularly between 2014 and 2018, although it's plateaued off, um, although not so much for natural language processing, interestingly. Then in terms of services trade, this has also been over the past decade, there's also been a big increase in UK services imports. And as you can see, this is the top five UK's top five import partners in developing countries, um, and India is by far the largest one, and services imports have kind of more than doubled over the past 10 years. So then the empirical strategy, relatively simple strategy here, I'm looking at the impact of growth in the machine learning related share of adverts as a metric for demand for machine learning, and its impact on the change, the growth, in services offshoring. And here I'm taking long differences over a five year specification. So I'm asking what is the impact in the growth in demand for machine learning on growth in demand for services offshoring? Specifically, I'll, I'll be looking at low and middle income countries as a metric for developing countries. Um, obviously, this is not exogenous. There's many reasons why there's both common shocks and probably reverse causality between services offshoring and um, the demand for mach machine learning. So my identification strategy is a classic Arctic style strategy, looking at firm region industry base level exposure to exogenous, hopefully technology supply side driven advances in the capabilities of AI. So the idea here being that that a lot of advances in machine learning over the past five years have been driven, say, by um, AlphaGo or DeepMind or the large tech companies, or for example, Oxford University um, or other global universities making big research strides. And given I'm excluding all tech, the whole tech sector and education sector in this data, the idea is that these are plausibly exogenous to say the law firms or the accounting firms or the retail firms, which are then discovering that they can actually use these new applications of AI. So I'm specifically using measures developed by um, Felton et al. 
where what they have taken is this data set from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which has measured and mapped um, advances in very specific sub-disciplines of AI, for example, image recognition or reading comprehension, and how they've developed over time using things like academic articles or kind of groundbreaking patents and specific um, advances in those indust industries. Then what Felton et al have done is mapped these to the occupations most likely to be conducting those tasks to then create measures of how much different occupations have been exposed to these advances in AI over the past five years. This allows me to then develop these baseline measures of how exposed firms, industries and regions were, um, say 2012, or I've also tried looking back 10 years um, prior to that to hopefully evolve avoid any endogeneity. So what do I find using all of that? So the first key finding from this paper is there has been this substantial rise in the demand for AI skills in the UK um, over this time period. And most importantly, this has been prevalent across a wide variety of industries, which is suggestive that AI is a general purpose technology and is one that's very broadly applicable. Then secondly, I found that growth in AI demand in the UK has actually caused an increase in services offshoring, but this increase has only been felt for low and middle income countries and not high income countries. And when we delve into what's going on, it appears that the main country benefiting has been India. And this has been a causal impact on the offshoring of business services, ICT related services, and things like computer information and telecom services. So specifically, okay, great, thanks. Um, looking, so firstly, this is taking the regional results um, for both, we've got narrowly defined AI, sorry, machine learning, which is just machine learning and AI related skills, and then broadly defined also includes data science, natural language processing and IT automation. And this is for low and middle income countries as classified by the World Bank. And what we find is a big positive causal impact. So for example, in column three, taking these results, suggesting an in a one standard deviation increase in growth in the machine learning share, leads to an almost doubling in services offshoring to low and middle income countries. So quite sizable coefficients. This also holds at both the industry and the firm level as well, although industry level results are slightly less um, consistent. Then in terms of high income countries, on the other hand, this is the same regressions and, and looking only, limiting the sample only to imports from higher income countries and there's very limited effect. Then this is taking, looking at the four largest, the UK's four largest import partners in um, low and middle income countries. And we see the result is strongest for India on the left, uh, but also some signs of an effect for South Africa was no impact for China and Brazil. These results are also consistent across industries and firms as well. So what are the conclusions from this? So there has been a fast growth in demand for AI skills in the UK, which has been across a broad range of industries. And this has a surprisingly positive impact on service offshoring. And interestingly, it's mainly felt for low and middle income countries, whereas there's no effect for high income countries. And it looks like India and South Africa are the main countries making up this effect. So I haven't gone in today into the model or any of the kind of mechanisms in the interest of time, but there's many plausible reasons why this could be happening. One is simply that AI has a productivity effect. Another is that AI is enabling complementary offshoring of processes of the AI production process. So parts of automation or offshoring parts of um, the automation process themselves or the AI development which would make sense for India, given it's such a um, IT hub and a leader in that, that area. But 
generally a lot more work needs to be done to understand what's going on in a lot more depth, but these are some preliminary results. Great, so, so that's, that's the end of my presentation for today. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to you, Jan. Well, thank you very much for this really interesting presentation, Catherine. Um, we have uh, one speaker left, so uh, I'm happy to pass on to Song, um, who will have the floor for the next 15 minutes. Thank you, Jen. Um, so I'm going to share a screen here. Um, can you see it here? I think you need to go and um, unshare your slides and then go full screen first, please. So. Yeah. You're right. Now good? Great, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks uh, for coming to um, our presentation. And um, so this project loop is a joint with Matteo Cevlati in Bologna, Elena Esposito in Musam, and uh, Uberson in Munich. So we basically study um, how malaria will affect the Chinese econo economic activities in Africa. Um, all right. Okay. Motivation project com comes from the fact that um, the African countries has you know considerably defi deficiency in terms of infrastructure which is essential for the economic growth and as a consequence of the lack of financial resources. And for the past 20 years, actually, um, you know, China has been, um, you know, Africa has been, you know, attracting a considerable flows of infrastructure funding, especially from China. But the problem is that what's the determinants of location of China's foreign economic, economic activity in Africa? It's not fully understood. So in this project, we would study whether and how malaria, which is a, a very important disease uh, in Africa, will affect the China's economic activities in Africa. Um, as you may know that malaria is a life-threatening infectious disease and transmitted by the female uh, mosquitoes. And so the numbers tell that it caused more than half a million deaths per year worldwide. And almost 90% cases and deaths occurs in Africa. So it's estimated that the malaria will bring about you know, 12 billion USD dollar per year and reduce the GDP growth in Africa by 1.3% annually. And it's also the hypothesis that the malaria exposure, it might affect development through you know, affecting the foreign economic activities like you know, trade, FDI, and you know, foreign infrastructure projects. But this channel has not been tested. So what are we gonna do in this paper? We create two geolocalized data set on the Chinese infrastructure construction projects and the presence of Chinese workers, which is measured by a social network platform which is called Weibo uh, in China. And we employ a new identity identification strategy we take into sight uh, inside from the malaria epidemiology and explore two types of malaria risk, malaria exposure risk and outbreak risk, or let's say malaria endemic um, risk and epidemic risk, okay? And so we study the impact of malaria on Chinese economic activity in terms of the infrastructure projects and at one by one and degree cell level. So one latitude times one longitude degree, degree cell level. And we found that malaria leads to fewer Chinese infrastructure projects, especially in the skill intensive sectors. And why this happened? And I mean, this impact um, took place and through uh, the channel of uh, you know, malaria will negatively and uh, reduce the presence of the Chinese workers because the realization of the projects, um, you know, the Chinese projects heavily you know, depends on the presence of Chinese workers. We also explore you know, virus mechanisms to cope with malaria risks, which we are gonna tell a bit in detail later. Um, so I'm going to skip the literature and contribution. Basically, this project is mostly correlated with the you know, role of the geography for economic development and the, the impact of malaria and malaria eradication for development, as well as impact of you know, health factors on FDIs. Um, all right. So China, the back some background information is that you know China has been you know playing an increasingly important roles in Africa. Uh, <clears throat> specifically, for example. Um, in 2015, 
and the Chinese company has to be, you know, undertake and the infrastructure projects in Africa, um, you know, the value is by 50.5 billion USD dollar. And this account around you know, 50%, the, the market share in the whole Africa. And there are a lot of Chinese works there, like, you know, by end of 2015, around um, 260,000. And uh, one important pattern um, of Chinese pro um, it, Activities there is that the realization of the Chinese projects heavily depend on you know presence of Chinese worker. Why? Because Chinese companies they prefer to bring the neighbors from China to Africa to carry out their projects because you know they are more familiar with the process organization and they gain the skill to install the machines and you know to to mentor the local workers. So um, as a matter of fact, um, basically. These Chinese firms they are more likely to you know, employ a large share of Chinese in skill intensive sectors and the more you know, local African workers in labor intensive sectors. And, and also another fact is that Chinese generally really lack the natural immunity to malaria. So this implies that you know, malaria they might affect the Chinese activity, especially when this activity requires the presence of the Chinese workers, right? Um, we use two sets of data. The first is uh, um, you know, the infrastructure projects um, from China. This is just a, this is a cross section um, study. Um, we took the project's uh, data in 2014. So we have all the you know, con uh, contracted engineering projects, value about 500 million US dollar. We have the project name, the value, the host country, and the company names. And we also manually search you know, the precise project location on the internet. And, and another feature of the uh, pro, uh, this uh, paper is that uh, we uh, we managed to track the location of the Chinese workers through um, a social network uh, platform, which is called Weibo. So this is like a Chinese equivalent of Twitter. Um, so we have all the geotagged po geo posts by around the twenty four thousand you know individuals in Africa. They are basically all Chinese because this uh, platform is uh, is basically in um, Chinese language, and we gain the detail the information on their, um, you know, the ID and the date of the post, the coordinate, like location, so help us to, you know, lo localize, you know, which place or which, you know, good cell he's in, and we know the text of each post, as well as many other, you know, individual uh, verbal, uh, information. We managed to identify if a Weibo user is a worker or not um, by applying a supervised text analysis um, for a bag of word approach. So give us um, a quick fact is that the left hand side um, figure is a uh, infrastructure projects location of them and the, the right side is um, uh, the Chinese workers. So as we can see what we can get from this figure, you say that actually uh, um, it, it consists of a display very similar patterns that you know the distribution and the, the, the project and the Chinese worker are very similar, right? If we see there are place some more um, Chinese workers, they're more likely to have the projects. Um, it tells us the realization of these projects involves the presence of Chinese workers. And in terms of malaria epidemiology, which is you know the source of our you know identification strategy, is that the malaria is an infectious disease, right? You know, transmitted by the um, the mosquitoes. And if you contract it, this can lead to death if you're not treated you know promptly. But if you survive, and you can gain the partial immunity and temporarily. But if a place, you know, is historically exposed to malaria, then this can develop the genetic immunity to malaria. And the, the malaria, you know, in, in this, in intensity measure we, we use is, a malaria, is called so the malaria ecology index. And um, so this uh, is a function of the characteristic of a mosquito vector and also um, the climate conditions, which is uh, in, in Africa. This is a tiny variant, um, invariant, um, indicator range from 0 to 38. So basically, the, lar the larger the index, the stronger the stability of the malaria. And if a lower index, it means the immunity of, uh, and you have the lower, you know, stability uh, of, and the force of the malaria transmission, at the same time, the people there have lower immunity to malaria. So in this project, we disentangle two types of risk. The first is a uh, a malaria endemic risk. That is, say, is the malaria is an endemic disease in a place. So we create a dummy variable if it's equal to zero, even one, 
if you know, my ecology index is greater than 15, and uh, uh, another variable, Mara epidemic equal to one, if it's uh, malaria ecology index is between zero and 15, right? And um, notice that fact that if in a place and uh, the people there have little immunity to malaria and here, and there are, you know, some climate condition uh, satisfied for malaria transmission, then there has a high likelihood for uh, malaria epidemic outbreaks. Therefore, there are two types of malaria risk. The first is malaria endemicity, which is say, okay, Malaria is an endemic disease. And uh, their second type is that there is malaria outbreak risk if there are two conditions satisfied. First, the people there have a little immunity to malaria. Second, the climate conditions are satisfied. So an um, RMPQ strategy is that um, we, we have the activity, Chinese activity on the left-hand side variable, and we also um, combine the malaria end endemic risk and the malaria epidemic an outbreak risk by interact these two variable. This uh, MSM is a climate condition and uh, indicator variable for this uh, you know, low immunity of the local people, uh, and and the worst controlling a uh, rich bunch uh, a rich bunch of you know um, you know geographic and economic controls. Especially for example, we have you know two G signal coverage to account for the fact that you know internet coverage might affect the Chinese uh, uh, work uh, you know the web users activity there. So. For our um, baseline result is a first look at impact of the malaria risk on you know the Chinese project. Um, the the takeaway of this uh, table is that we can say uh, the malaria and endemic risk and have negative impact on the number of the projects in hydropower and the public buildings, which are usually you know um, regarded as a skill intensive sectors, and um, even though. Uh, it also have you know display negative impact on the number though it's not significant. So we would like to ask what's the channel, right? The channel is that the malaria might affect the Chinese project through affecting you know the Chinese worker because they are not immune to malaria, right? And uh, at, at the same time, the realization of the Chinese projects depends on you know, the presence of the Chinese worker. So we would like to say the correlation between the Chinese worker and the projects. What we do is like we, thank you. We we regress the number of the, the Chinese uh, the projects and the number of the, the Chinese workers in each grid cell, and uh, we find their strong and positive correlation between the workers and the number of projects, which you know confirm our hypothesis that the realization of the projects, the Chinese projects, you know, depends on well, uh, the presence of the Chinese worker, and then. Then we, 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 we try to check if, you know, the malaria risk will affect the Chinese worker, the presence of Chinese worker or not. And we look at both, you know, at the full sample and the subsample, you know, with, you know, all the positive malaria ecology, which means that there's a, a positive malaria risk. And then we found that there's a strong and a very robust negative impact of malaria uh, risk on the number of the, uh, the, the, the log number of the web users in Africa. Basically, like if a place, if it's a malaria endemic place, it means that in column four, there are like 28% um, less, you know, Chinese workers there, which have a you know, huge impact. Um, yes, there are a lot of robust check and can escape it. If you ask, I can come back later. Um, okay, here. Okay, we also explore several attenuation mechanisms in a sense that and um, you know what type of mechanism has been adopted to cope with the malaria risk. The first thing is that and uh, we first look at the role of the immunity of Chinese worker in a sense that we find the Chinese workers, if they have higher you know um, you know genetic immunity, they're more likely to be placed in more malarious place, right? And so it means that you know either the company or the individual themselves they might uh, you know to try to deal with this um, risk and depends on their own immunity level. The second is that the Chinese company, they, they may substitute the, the Chinese workers with local African people. And we found that, you know, local workers, that that if they have a higher immunity, uh, you know, the immunity level of local African, if the immunity level is uh, higher, then there are fewer Chinese workers. And last, we look at, you know, the role of the anti-malaria policies. 
and to say if you know some other like you know um, medical facilities and the medicine availability will affect the uh, the Chinese presence of Chinese workers, and we do find that um, the therapy availability will you know increase the number of the Chinese workers in Africa. Um, so for the first one is the, the, the you know the role of the immediate Chinese worker. What we do is that we a link um, the 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 malaria risk of his position in Africa to his own or her own immunity level. And uh, here um, the independent variable is a bunch of you know immunity measure of the Chinese worker, right? And the dependent variable is the risk level of his location in Africa. And we found that there is a positive correlation. It's like if he have higher immunity to malaria, then he's more likely to go to risk place. And then and we also include the you know the immunity of the African people. And we found that if African people have higher you know, immunity, immunity level to malaria, then there are fewer Chinese workers. So they substitute Chinese worker with uh, an African people. The last is um, uh, the you know the therapy availability in a place will also you know increase the Chinese workers there. So to conclude, um, we found the malaria reduced the Chinese infrastructure projects in Africa, especially in the skilled intensive sectors. And as the presence of Chinese workers serve as a channel, right? And there are also several attenuation mechanisms adopted to moderate the negative impact of the malaria. Okay, thank you. This is uh, the end of my presentation. Well, thank you very much for this interesting presentation, Song, and thank you very much to um, all our speakers. We'll now open the floor to uh, the Q&A, and um, we are going to um, do it one paper at a time in the same uh, order that we just listened to the presentations, roughly around three to four questions, uh, and then we'll go back hopefully into a second and potentially a third round. Um, so first, um, going back to the first presentation, I would ask uh, Rary Agarwal um, to unmute and ask their question, please. Hi, thank you. Um, my question was basically about how quality upgrading takes place when input costs rise. I didn't completely understand. So the Indian government imposes tariffs, for example, on Chinese products, which happen to be intermediate inputs in, in the production process. So is it the case that um, now firms can switch to inputs that are of better quality produced within the country that were earlier too expensive before the tariff hike. So it's a relative price effect. And if there are any other channels. And also, could there be a role of energy efficiency uh, also in quality upgrading? Thank you. Great. Um, Jan, do you want to take a few at a time or should I, should I go now? Uh, no, feel free to go now. Cool, cool, cool. Um, yeah, I think, um, so on the first one, so the, the story was the removal of tariffs rather than the imposition. Um, uh, but there, there's, there's definitely an element in that there's a sort of strange counterintuitive thing of marginal costs rising rather than falling. And I think what's behind that is that uh, higher quality inputs tend to have higher prices. Um, and it's just that quality rises, the output quality rises, um, and output prices rise by more. So you actually have, um, so the firm is still better off. Um, on the, um, the other aspect is that even if the input prices are rising, their um, quality itself is rising by more. And so you still have a fall in quality adjusted prices on the inputs. On the energy efficiency one, uh, that's really interesting. I have to, I have to go and think about that. Um, uh, I think, you know, I think there are some other papers that look at um, energy efficiency in manufacturing plants. Um, so I might be able to, you know, see what see what those people use and see if this kind of quality upgrade is also correlated with um, increasing energy efficiency. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Paul Otom with a question. Yes, um, thank you very much for uh, a nice presentation. I would want to ask, uh, as you demonstrated well that uh, tariffs were declining since China joined uh, the WTO, it would be good to have a sense on um, the evolution of non-tariff barriers because 
uh, this seems to be increasingly replacing tariffs as, as a barrier to trade. And what uh, would that, the implication of that on bilateral trade between China and India, and of course, on the value chains. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think um, ultimately, I think non-tariff barriers are harder to measure, um, which is why I sort of didn't start there. Um, uh, because of, of, uh, often by their nature they're kind of implicit um, but I do I, uh, I believe that there are various people who've constructed their own measures of non-tariff barriers um, globally so it's on my list is to try and play those in and see see how those affect the, uh, the story but yeah it's a good point. Thank you and uh, next we have uh, Adrian Lees. Hi, can you hear me now? Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Alex. This has been very interesting results and a very interesting presentation. Um, I just had a question about whether you can see anything more in terms of sectoral heterogeneity in your results. I mean, we often hear stories or research pointing to kind of trade winners and trade losers, especially within certain industries in certain countries. And those losers might be clustered, well, and the winners might be clustered in certain regions. So like one district specializes in a certain good, like a t-shirt, imports undercut the local firms and those firms then suffer. And so that region overall suffers in a kind of simplified scenario. So yeah, I was just wondering if there's anything in your data that you could tease out uh, regarding sectors and which sectors might be more high risk of being losers to the extent that that's useful for a policymaker to then be able to target relief support or yeah, any kind of support to certain regions where they believe industries might be more at threat from trade liberalization. Yeah, hey Eddie, um, yeah, good question. Um, uh, so I do have, um, location data for about two thirds of the sample. Um, there's a whole story about um, uh, how to get that. But so that means that I now can start doing some spatial stuff. The first thing I did was just sort of control out for, um, you know, district time trends. Um, so kind of quite a negative way of using it just as a robustness check. Um, but there's definitely, so there's some stuff in the networks literature about, um, you know, geographic co-location effects, whether you have um, I was looking at spillovers through the production network, but maybe if lots of these firms are in the same district, they all have sort of uh, negative or positive effects on each other. Um, so that's definitely something I'm looking to exploit that, that data that I've now got access to um, and see if that extra channel comes in. The, the ideal would be to be able to say, you know, the production network amplifies things by this much. And then if I turn on the location effects, you know, it goes up by this much or it's moderated by cheaper wages or something. Um, and then, uh, then that would allow me to speak more both to geographic heterogeneity, but also industry heterogeneity. Yeah, it's a really good point. All right, thank you very much for, for these questions. Um, I hope we'll come back to you later on, Alex, because I do also have a question for you. Uh, but for now, let's uh, move on to, to Olamide, um, where I'd ask Lisa Martin to start with uh, their question, please. Um, yeah. Thanks so much for your presentation. I have a kind of methodological question about um, your synthetic control, um, because I was wondering how exactly you constructed the donor pool. I know you said that your the countries in the control group, of course, um, they shouldn't have been subject to trade liberalization themselves in the period which you study. But just from um, the glance that I took at that list of countries, it just seems like with India in there, Argentina, um, I'm just curious about, um, yeah, how you constructed that donor pool, because it does seem like some of them might have actually had some trade liberal liberalization themselves, and were there any other criteria that you used to construct that donor pool? Uh, sure, thank you for your question. Um, so I uh, constructed the donor pool by just getting data for as many countries as possible, and excluding the ones that based on the Sachs Warner criteria, um, have liberalized in the period considered. And so the year of liberalization um, or, or liberalization here is defined by the, I think it's four uh, things that are in the criteria for the Sachs-Warner um, trade liberalization. So 
So these countries are countries that, for example, uh, average of tariffs of um, 40% or less um, and non-tariff barriers of 40% or less. And so the way the trade liberalization year is determined is um, based on a particular criteria. Um, and um, there's a bit more that can be said about that, but um, for now, I think, and then for the method, um, the generalized synthetic control, the GSIN um, package um, uses, firstly uses um, interactive fixed effect model to get the weights that are assigned to each country and then uses these weights to um, create a synthetic control unit. So um, yeah, I'm not sure if that really answers your question, but um, yeah, no, thank you. That's a, that's really good. You didn't report the um, weights in your presentation, right? Is there is your synthetic control primarily made up of uh, just a small number of countries and the other ones receive really small weights? Or? Um, the It's made up of actually a small number of countries because, um, because very few countries have liberalized um, in that in the period considered uh, because it's an African country. Um, I think I present the weights in the paper itself, um, which is on the website. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me just remind everyone, please feel free to uh, still post your questions uh, in the Q&A uh, as we'll be going back to um, uh, through all the papers. And for the people on the panel, uh, remind you that you need to raise your hand if you want to ask a question because you can't actually post uh, in the Q&A box. Um, so next we'll go to uh, Socrates uh, Majun, please. Uh, okay, uh, many thanks. Uh, well, let me then, uh, congratulations for your presentation. Mine is more of um, the application towards you what, you are, what your findings are. Because you're trying to say that liberalization uh, has been a driver towards uh, the industrialization by the fact that services have actually grown while manufacturing sector and also agriculture have been affected. So the, we currently have the African continent of free trade area rolling. Do you then think that from your results, uh, we are likely to still have a booming services sector while the manufacturing sector is likely to do Poorly. Uh, in short, do you think the industrialization is likely to proceed uh, with regards to your results? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. I think, I, I don't think that the results of this paper imply that since uh, this paper is looking at a particular trade liberalization episode and um, trying to see um, what would have happened if this episode did not occur. And so I'm not sure that um, these results can then be extrapolated to another um, form of liberalization. Um, also, the way trade liberalization is defined here is also, um, like I said, based on uh, a particular criteria for trade openness, which the free trade area, I think, is um, a different kind of um, trade agreement to just a general trade liberalization. Also, um, in a sense, you can think about the trade liberalization episode in this paper kind of in a binary way. That's not what's happening, but um, there's it's a yes or no, is this country liberalized in this period or not? And it's a yes or no, as opposed to a particular form of trade liberalization or trade agreement. So I don't think that this paper implies that. Um. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a question by Luke Milsom. Hi, thanks uh, for your presentation. Um, I had a, uh, another question about the uh, synthetic control. Um, I was wondering if um, if you've done, if you performed a uh, kind of inference on your on your interesting results, um, I wasn't sure if you presented that in the uh, in the presentation. Um, you know, with the kind of placebo lines and uh, and and stuff. Um, so I'd be interested to hear about that. Yes. Um, so when I first started um, this 
when I first started this research, I actually just used synthetic control methods and not generalized synthetic control methods, which with that, I had to do a lot of placebo tests. And I found those hard to do because it's already difficult enough to find data for the one country that I'm working on and to think of like placebos for it. Uh, and when I did that, the results looked really weird. And so the reason I chose to use generalized synthetic control methods is that um, it actually calculates the necessary confidence intervals and standard errors in itself. And so it means that there should not be any need to follow up with a placebo treatment as would be necessary with the SCM approach. So I haven't done that. Um, I would still love to do it if, it if it was possible, but it's just honestly, mostly because of uh, the availability of data that there are no placebo treatments done here. Thank you. Let me just sneak a very quick question in here um, that I was wondering about when we think about services, whether you're thinking about um, kind of internationally tradable, domestically tradable or kind of locally non-tradable services. And also, secondly, when these regressions on the, say, the employment share are all done individually, right? So the kind of there's not like a joint counterfactual where all these shares add up to one. And so I was wondering whether there would be any way to uh, enforce that. Mm, oh, okay. So for the first question, um, it's inter it's mostly internationally tradable services because the other research that um, supports my results um, actually finds that um, with when tr when trade with trade liberalization for most African countries and a lot of them, uh, some of them have used Ghana. And you find that there's an increase in uh, employment in the service sector, especially in the internationally traded service sector. So I think this is really what is driving uh, that rise in employment share. Um, can you repeat the second question again, sorry? Uh, so those are um, the kind of regressions you're running on how, or the counterfactual of how say the employment share in agriculture would have evolved in, in the absence of the trade liberalization that's kind of independent of the same exercise on the manufacturing employment share, independent yeah. of the services employment share. So in yeah. that sense, they don't have to add up to one, um, I would imagine. Um, and so I was wondering whether there would be one way, which I, I can't think about from the top of my head, but also not an, not an expert in the area, uh, to uh, kind of make them add up to one and constrain them in yeah. some way. That would be interesting. Um, it, they are, so it, I run each of them individually. Um, the, the GSC itself constrains um, the weights to sum up to one, but what you're asking is a step further, which I think would be interesting and is something that I will, that I think I can consider working on. Um, but yeah, like you said, it's actually all individual. So yeah, it wouldn't add up to one. So that would be interesting. Thank you. And uh, next we're going to moving on to, to Catherine and um, Nicholas uh, Monica uh, has a question, please. Yes, uh, so Catherine, thank you so much for this super interesting uh, presentation. I, I just had a very uh, slightly cheap comment or question here, which is the following. So now that we're looking at human displacing technology, isn't looking at human recruitment data a bit besides the point? As in like, and uh, let me kind of uh, clarify a bit what I mean. I, I understand the connection between you're looking for proxies of who's employing AI uh, uh, technology. Um, but in, in my mind, the companies who are developing the AI would be recruiting these engineers who, who, who are kind of, who can use machine learning technologies, that these, these companies are quite distinct from the services companies who are uh, uh, providing these offshoring kind of services. And so that to some extent that what you're tracing is kind of the, the wrong kind of the wrong employment growth, but maybe I just misunderstood how you constructed these roughly. Yeah, I mean, so let me just summarize what I think your, your question is. So the problem with using job advert data to look at the demand for machine learning skills is that you think what a machine learning engineer say does is different to what would be being displaced? Is that your question? Yeah, so 
I think the so the first part is this use of looking at job adverts to backwards induce deployment because ideally what you would want is you would just ask firms directly like are you using machine learning what do you use machine learning for how much do you use it how much have you invested in it unfortunately we don't have that data so the idea is if you're a company in the UK and you're building any form of machine learning related system or using machine learning in any way you're probably going to have had to hire someone with some machine learning skills at some point at least it should be a proxy measure there's also a lot of things which could be plausible that you could hire a consultancy you could um, train your in-house staff but generally you would probably assume even if you train your in-house staff you're probably going to also hire at least someone specialized, like some tech lead or something. Um, so that's the kind of thinking behind the measure is that it's like a broad proxy measure. Um, and also it's being kind of widely used now in the literature in the absence of better understanding of actual um, firm reported technology adoption. And does that kind of half answer the first part of your question? It does, it does. Okay, but in terms of the second part of would you expect, say, a machine learning engineer you're hiring to be doing something different? So I guess the idea, the idea is you'd hire, say, a machine learning engineer to build some form of automated system. So say like you'd build a chatbot um, or you'd program your chatbot and that would therefore replace some part of the tasks that normally just a call center employee in India might be working on. So that's the kind of causal chain we're, like we're assuming here. Does Thanks that make sense? Yeah, no, it, it does make sense. I think I would just maybe like going forward, I think I would try to add at least some anecdotal evidence that that's what's happening because I think if people think of, like I think when you have capital, uh, if you go in more capital intensive in the production, then usually we think of, oh yeah, sure, you need high skilled labor to kind of maintain that capital, like a machine. But for AI, I think this is a special case where it's off the shelf and it's not directly obvious if you really need your in-house machine learning expert to, to do these tasks, but, but maybe I'm, I'm just wrong. Uh, so, so it would be nice if you can just show that. Thanks. Yeah, you might be right. It, I, it definitely does need to be validated. I think, I mean, of the like, the number of other papers using these measures i think they have found some ways to validate it i haven't yet for the uk because there's like far more scarce data on actual metrics of use of machine learning in the uk than there is in the us but yeah i i'll have a think if there's some better way to validate that thank you great question though. all right uh, thank you and um, we are running a bit low on time so we're gonna pull uh Luke's question with uh, two more questions by myself. And um, the one thing I was wondering about is farm heterogeneity, whether there's anything you can say about, even at the industry level, what's the kind of farm size distribution in terms of um, who uh, adapts these, these technologies and who does services trade? I mean, we know, I, I would imagine both of these being very high productive firms. Um, so it kind of would be interesting to see that and how that plays out in, uh, kind of general equilibrium and secondly um, whether we might be currently in an adoption period when it comes to kind of AI and machine learning technologies and so whether what you are finding are kind of results relating to this adoption period and then the kind of steady state um, kind of interaction between using AI and uh, services offering might actually be different and now I'll pass on to Luke and then um, to you Catherine. Uh, yeah, kind of related to, to Jan's second question there, I was interested in the kind of magnitude of the effects we're talking about here, you know, like uh, to, to what extent has the, the rise in AI use in UK firms, like is this causing a, a thousand more jobs in like offshoring jobs or, or like what are, what are the kind of magnitude effects? And then related to Jan's question, um, uh, what does this look like going forward if we expect that we're going to be moving towards this, um, this, this kind of higher equally room adoption? Okay, shall I try and respond to those then? Not okay, so, so Jan's first question, firm size distribution. Yeah, so this is a great question. And 
so far, so the data already only includes pretty much very large firms or is skewed towards larger firms. And job adverts data is of course skewed to white collar um, and larger firms. But then when we look at machine learning adoption within those firms, it really is extremely concentrated. Um, I haven't, I haven't yet put out all these descriptive stats on that, but it's very much like a superstar firm story of like a tiny slither of the firm size distribution that's like the largest, most productive firms, as, as has been found with like most technologies and particularly more cutting edge and more advanced and harder to adopt technologies. Likewise, offshoring is, is of course limited to like far larger, far more productive firms. So I think this story is very much a, like the top, yeah, um, very top part of the, the firm size and productivity distribution. Then the question, your second question, Jan, on in this initial effect and then plateauing. I think that's a really good question. And I'm not sure whether you had read the um, Eric Van Holsen and co-authors, their paper on the productivity J-curve that actually a lot of, I'm not sure whether this is what you were thinking about when you were talking about this, but they've shown this, that adoption of these technologies, you first have to invest a lot in intangible capital and it takes a long time before you see productivity effects. So I'm not sure if that's kind of what you were alluding to, um, but I would expect there would be like big dynamic effects. And I would also expect that like global value chains are extremely sticky and probably there's like massive fixed costs of like, you set up your whole, say like customer service, part of your business somewhere else, like in India, in India or the Philippines, and then AI becomes available. And probably for a lot of firms, you might not see it have an impact for a long time. So it could well be that this is some positive initial and then it eventually gets negative at some point. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good point. Does that answer, or should I try and answer then the third question, which was on, on magnitudes? Um, so Luke's question on magnitudes. Yeah, I mean, in, in summary, these magnitudes are pretty high. If a one, the, the baseline specification is of one standard deviation effect, kind of there's a really substantial 100%, so doubling services offshoring. Although I suppose a one standard deviation movement given um given the fact that this as I, I mentioned there's this concentration of machine learning in like very high productivity firms that shift jump in the share of like 0 0.001 of the share of machine learning habits might actually be a move say from like a company that you know hired like a few machine learning engineers to one that's like google and has a massive department and then it's completely game-changing so that could be one of the, the reasons. Otherwise, I'm, I'm not quite sure why, why I'm seeing such large, large effects, to be honest. Does that answer? Feel free to give any more follow-up questions. All right, thank you very much. Um, let's just, um, we are running slightly over and I take full responsibility and apologize for that. Um, so just um, collecting uh, questions for, um, for Song. I'll, I'll start myself. Basically what I was wondering is whether um you could use some kind of weather vari variability across years uh, in some way to create more kind of temporal uh, variation um in in your work uh, then we have uh, alex and then luke uh, yeah oh yes you, yes please go ahead sorry Tom. um love love the paper it's a really quick one um I wasn't sure, I, I didn't quite catch what exactly, what the Weibo data you have is, and whether you have, what text you have. So I was wondering if you could look at some more kind of outcome variables, like sort of sentiment analysis of the text, whether people are, you know, more miserable if they're in a malarial location or whatever, that kind of stuff. So should I uh, go to that? Yeah, so, uh, yes, so, uh, thanks, Song. Yeah, very uh, interesting work. I was just, um, so, so I, I think I, it might have been in one of your robustness checks, or, or, or I may have missed it. Um, but, but I was wondering whether it could be the case that these, these areas that have 
uh, you know, high malaria and, th and therefore, as you show, kind of low uh, investment uh, activity from, from, from China. It could be that these areas are different uh, ex ante uh, anyway, perhaps they're less uh, hospitable or, uh, um, or, or, or as the kind of literature on, um, um, on like the old kind of uh, colonial infrastructure shows that um, they have less, uh, kind, of, uh, kind of less of that, so, so they might look different. Thanks. All right, so um, <clears throat> I can answer, reply to Jen's, to Jen's question. Uh, the first is that uh, you're right. Um, so this uh, currently it's a temporary, it's a cross-section analysis, um, but actually we do have, for example, um, a data fund of the date and the, you know, the date of the Weibo post, at least in our data set. So we're exploring that by, you know, controlling for the self-fix effect, you know, to exclude, uh, to say, um, um, to controlling for the fixed effect and to, to exclude more, some other, you know, um, omitted variables and so, so forth. And uh, we do find that, uh, I mean, we haven't included in the, um, in, in, in the presentation, but our preliminary analysis is that uh, um, even controlling for the sale fix effect, uh, so we are running um, a month and sale um, panel regression, and still it display a negative impact uh, from malaria and the uh, number of the Chinese workers in each group sale. Uh, even though it's not significant, but um, the sense is that uh, even we look at the, you know a very high frequent and uh, you know. Um, panel regression. The sense is, uh, it's a very, it's not very likely, and uh, the Chinese workers they will move you know, across months uh, you know, within short, such, such a short period. You know, usually if they work there, they they will sign a contract. You stay there um, for half a year or one or two years. Maybe you're gonna move back to China, you know, for Chinese New Year, and but and for the most of the time you will stay in that place and to carry out this project. And yeah, this is a um, answer to that. Uh, the second for um, uh, Alexander, yes. Um, for the Weibo, we have the text in that uh, exact uh, the content of the each web post, like you know the record, the life, um, the their job, you know their their work, and there are also some you know post pictures. So what do we do to do uh, to to use this um, data set that uh, we we have bunch of the words which is highly re relevant to each type of industry or. Um, Type of industry and to say if their contents or their self description you know match and uh, those words in this list of uh, in the keywords and to say okay if you belong to this industry or that industry to identify okay which sector you are you know uh, work in and in terms of sentiment analysis um, this would be our second order um, you know priority that uh, first of the data size is uh, some size is not very large it's, it's around you know 24000 or something i i remember if you're going to do the you know sentiment analysis it, it usually requires around 1 million or more than that right so and we have a limited amount of the you know um like the the, the data um point here um, but uh, we will definitely look into that to say if there's some new development of this tech, um, this method, and if we can adopt it or not. But we do find, you know, in their text, they post, uh, okay, their feeling or their uh, experience of, you know, contracting malaria um, disease, and they do say that, and they say, okay, I had a fever, have a cold, and they're feeling. So it's like, you know, malaria is a thing um, for the Chinese there. And for look at the yes robustness check in I'm not sure if I got your question correctly, but uh, um, you're right. Um, there we we face a omitted variable problem that um, um, so correct me correct correct me if I'm wrong is that uh, for example the malaria might affect um, uh, you know the Chinese. Uh, um, activities through affecting, for example, institution or economic development, even though we're controlling for a bunch of, you know, such uh, uh, variables, but still we cannot fully, you know, exclude that, right? So what we're doing that, uh, we currently we're testing the linear impact of the malaria on, you know, either institution, uh, you know, historic one or, you know, temp contemporary one, uh, or, you know, economic development, uh, you know, um, historic and, uh, you know, contemporary development measure. And we do find that, uh, we, we don't find a very, you know, a, a very, you know, robust and clear linear pattern between malaria and the development. But um, um, 
Yeah, this is uh, so the way to to do that, and we we try to demonstrate that. Okay, um, those things we we will try our best to count controlling for that and to prove that you know that might not be um, a case um, to to try to weaken our result. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Song, and uh, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for these great presentations um, and for uh, staying with us, even though we were uh, going over time. Uh, apologies again for that. Um, I hope to see many of you in the environmental session coming up uh, in 20 minutes, so just enough time to get a proper break. Um, and well, have a good day, everyone, and thanks for coming. <laughs>